Good evening, or depending where you're located, maybe it's good morning or good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lauren Stiles. I am the president and founder of Dysautonomy International, and um, I'm going to host this webinar with Dr. Mitchell Miglis, who actually got caught up at his clinic, but that's okay because my slides are first, so he will be joining us shortly. Um, and this evening, we're going to talk about what we know so far about dysautonomia symptoms in patients with um, long-term symptoms of COVID-19, which, which patients have dubbed long haul, seems to be catching on in the a medical profession too, so we're happy using that term. Um, and what we know so far, and things that we think might be helpful for patients who are dealing with these long-term symptoms to understand. Uh, at the end of the webinar, Dr. Miglis and I will take some questions. Um, at any time during the webinar, you can type questions into your go-to webinar control panel. You should see somewhere along there, there's a, a place to type in questions. I also wanted to mention that there are two handouts that we have uploaded that you should be able to, to grab from the control panel. Um, one is a list of resources from Dysautonomy International that, may, that we're gonna talk about briefly during the webinar and that may be helpful to some patients. And then the second document is from Dr. Miglis and it's a log to track your orthostatic vitals, which is heart rate and blood pressure um, laying down and standing up. This is something you might want to do and, and share with your doctors. Okay, so I'm going to get started with our slides. This is just our, our brief bios. Strangely, our logos look very similar, but we're on the opposite coast. I'm on the East Coast in New York and Dr. Miglis is out in California. And uh, so first we're gonna talk about what, let's try to get on the same page about the conditions, the terms that we're using. So what is long haul COVID-19? So I'd say it's not really well defined yet. And some people are using this term to mean patients who are having symptoms after a month. Some doctors wanna use this term on um, patients who are having symptoms after three months and some different types of diagnostic criteria for certain chronic illnesses would require six months or longer uh, before we would sort of consider a problem, a, a chronic problem. So we are loosely using this term during this webinar. Um, if you have joined us, we are assuming that you are interested in, in long haul COVID and that you've, you've had symptoms going on for longer than expected from a, a virus. So what are the possible mechanisms for these long-lasting symptoms in any viral infection, but in particular in a, a COVID-19 infection? Well, you could have an ongoing active viral infection of the initial uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. You could, you could still have that going on. And, and I think that as more research is coming out, we're going to figure out some better, more accurate testing to help identify the virus. You know, is it going latent and, and sort of hiding out in some people and some parts of their nervous system as some other viruses do? Um, or is it really completely resolved? Um, and that's gonna, every, pretty much everything we talk about tonight needs more research to understand it. Um, then there's the idea you could have a secondary infection. It's not uncommon when you have a respiratory viral infection to um, sometimes develop a secondary, like a bacterial infection or something. So that could be making feel some people feel quite awful if it hasn't been um, diagnosed and treated. Um, your initial viral infection could have resolved and left some residual tissue damage. I think that's probably what scares patients the most is, you know, do I have some long-term damage from this and is this permanent? And I don't think we can tell you that for right now. Um, is, is the infection resolved and there's an ongoing immunological response? I would say this is probably the most likely scenario for most patients who have these long-term symptoms. Um, if their viral testing is coming back negative and they're still having long-term symptoms, this is a very important concept that we need to focus some research on. And it's certainly in progress. Um, there, there are lots of doctors, um, researchers taking an interest in this concept. It doesn't feel that way as a patient. We hear a lot of patients saying, I'm getting misdiagnosed, I'm getting doctors blowing me off and telling me it's all in my head. Um, that will change over time, you know, as more research comes out. It's super frustrating if you're dealing with that right now, but that will change. Um, another thing that we all need to be thinking about, even if you have one of the above problems, um, you could have developed some deconditioning. Um, and this isn't 
this isn't deconditioning like, oh, you're lazy and you laid on the couch for too long and therefore it's your fault. Deconditioning is a really serious problem that can happen in pretty much anyone who gets a viral infection. Um, and the longer you have been unwell with a virus, the more likely you are to develop some deconditioning. So you could actually, you know, you could have that and still have an active infection going on. So it's not one or the other. Um, I put other things we haven't figured out yet because since COVID is so new, there's there's so many question marks, we're not really sure. And then a combination of the above. And I, I think for a lot of people, it's probably going to be a combination of the above. Um, it's not uncommon in other viral infections for people to have um, a little bit of residual tissue damage, a little bit of an ongoing immunological response, and a little bit of deconditioning. So how do we tackle those things is, is the real question. So you might have heard this term in the media. Um, Dr. Petrino from Mount Sinai has been talking about this to a lot of reporters. So we've, I've spoken with him and we've, we kind of um, touched base because we're both in New York and we're both interested in this area for research purposes. I'm not a clinician, I'm a, a research professor, but I do um, have a pretty strong interest in this. And so anyways, he was using this term and speaking to a lot of media outlets. So we started getting inquiries at Dysautonomy International asking about post-viral dysautonomia. So it's not a specific medical diagnosis. It's sort of a generic term that means you've had a virus and now we think there's something going wrong with your autonomic nervous system. So autonomic nervous system dysfunction can be caused by a lot of different things. And probably the easiest way to classify it in terms of the, the time period is it can be acute during the infection could be transient, which is something that lasts, you know, a few months after the infection, but eventually resolves. And it could be chronic, which would be something that's lasting a really long time, six months or longer. Um, and there are autonomic disorders that fit into each of those three categories. There are some acute autonomic problems, there are transient autonomic problems, and then there are a lot of people who have chronic autonomic nervous system dysfunction. So what is dysautonomia? Um, we didn't come up with this word, it's a mouthful. Um, it's just a, a generic term for dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. If your doctor tells you you have a dysautonomia, um, that's not a diagnosis. It's sort of like saying you have cancer without telling you what type of cancer or where it is in your body or how severe it is. Um, so if someone says you have dysautonomia, try to get them to sort of pinpoint for you what type of dysautonomia you have. We'll get into this a little later, but a lot of doctors are not equipped to pinpoint the diagnosis. The fact that they're recognizing you have a, have a dysautonomia is actually a good step um, because there are a lot of doctors that still don't even recognize that. Um, so uh, an, a dysautonomia can be a structural dysautonomia where you actually have autonomic nerves that are damaged or missing. It could be a functional dysautonomia where the nerves are fully intact, but they're not working properly. And that can be due to things like antibodies or problems with the neurotransmitters that send the messages between the nerves. Uh, there's a lot of different things that could cause a, a dysfunction while the nerves are still intact. I want to use uh, that term carefully because there are some doctors who use the term functional to sort of mean uh, in a pejorative way, you know, oh, that's all in your head. Um, there, that's sort of one use of that term, functional, but there is another use which means literally your nerves are not functioning properly, and that is not, um, should not be considered sort of a derogatory term, but unfortunately in medicine, a lot of times it's used that way. And then a lot of people actually have both. If you have a structural problem, you might end up with a functional problem and vice versa. So um, the autonomic nervous system, this is actually, looks like a kind of a crazy chart, but it actually is a very minimalistic chart barely showing you all the amazing things that the autonomic nervous system does. Um, so if you have an organ, there's an autonomic nerve regulating it. Just think of it that way. It's sort of the way that your brain communicates with all of the different tissues and organs in your body. If you remember back to um, high school biology, you have sensory, sensory nerves that control your, your touch and taste and smell and your, your feeling of sensations on your skin. And then you have motor nerves that control that control your voluntary muscles, like lift my leg. That's your sort of voluntary thought process, and your motor nerves will handle that. And then your autonomic nervous system, that does all of the bodily functions you don't have to consciously think about. 
So when you eat a cheeseburger, after you're done chewing it, you really don't have to think about anything. Your body just takes care of that digestive process for you through your autonomic nervous system. So most of us um, take our autonomic nervous system completely for granted until it stops working properly. And then we realize, wow, that's a really important part of my nervous system. <laughs> um, and uh, it can cause many, many different symptoms because it regulates everything. So this is part of the problem why doc some doctors are not very, um, not very attuned to accurately diagnosing it because medicine right now is so divided up into super subspecialties and you rarely have someone who is looking at your lungs and thinking about your liver and thinking about your pupils and thinking about your blood volume. Um, doc, you know, medicine sort of has divided up into organ systems and the autonomic nervous system is a multidisciplinary problem. So, um, let's see, so if you wanted to sort of, if you were a doctor looking at a patient, trying to figure out, does this patient have autonomic dysfunction? These are the key things you'd be looking for. You, you'd want to look at the whole entire patient. You'd want to look for what's called orthostatic intolerance, which literally means someone is having a hard time tolerating standing up. Um, and people who have orthostatic intolerance will have abnormal heart rate or abnormal blood pressure when they stand up. Most often, their blood pressure might be dropping and their heart rate might be going up really fast. Um, other presentations can also happen, but that's usually the most common scenario. Um, gastrointestinal dysmotility, so your autonomic nervous system controls the movement of food and liquids through your GI tract. So you can have um, sort of like Goldilocks, a little bit too fast, a little bit too slow, or just right, or, or actually some patients have a combination of too fast and too slow. Um, and so that's, that's part of a dysautonomia. Pupil dysfunction, it's not talked about as often clinically, but um, if you know someone who has like severe sensitivity to bright sunlight and they get headaches from the sunlight, they might have sluggish pupils that don't dilate and constrict as quickly as a healthy person, and that's their autonomic nerves regulating the pupil dilation and constriction. Bladder uh, dysfunction can also be caused by an autonomic nervous system problem. Sweating is regulated by the autonomic nervous system, so we have patients who have excessive sweating or not enough sweating, um, or unusual patchy areas of sweating where maybe they don't sweat on their lower body, but their upper half of their body sweats too much. Um, dry eyes and dry mouth because the production of saliva and tears are both regulated by the autonomic nervous system. Temperature sensitivity, um, this could be, this could have a couple of different meanings. Um, a lot of people with dysautonomias are very sensitive to the heat because it's a, it, the heat vasodilates you and sort of makes it, um, makes it more likely that you will have low blood pressure or have um, some abnormal circulation. So these patients tend to be very heat sensitive, um, but there are also patients who have just a real sensitivity to changes in temperature, and that's um, in part due to their autonomic nervous system dysfunction. Flushing, um, more commonly on the upper half of the body, and men with uh, more severe autonomic dysfunction can develop erectile dysfunction. So you see this big list of symptoms, and all of you have probably had some of these symptoms at some point in your life. Does that mean, oh my God, I've had dysautonomia forever? No, um, some of these are sort of normal symptoms that come along with, you know, if you had a um, food poisoning, you might have some, some diarrhea and some GI dysmotility for a week, but that doesn't mean necessarily you had dysautonomia. So it's really important to look at the big picture. And there are some objective tests and um, diagnostic criteria used, and Dr. Miglis will get into that later in his presentation. This is an overview of the defined dysautonomias. Um, there are diseases where we have known pathology in the central nervous system that are tend to be neurodegenerative disorders seen in older people that are associated with Parkinson's. I don't think that that is going on in most COVID patients. There are certainly some case reports on um, serious brain complications in, in a small number of COVID patients, but I, those are um, at least in the autonomic disorders, those are usually, um, you know, older onset, not infectious related diseases. Then there's uh, peripheral neuropathies. 
in, in uh, autonomic disorders, and the most common being small disorders associated with small fiber neuropathies. These are the, the fibers that are found um, in each of your organs and also in your skin. And so if you've ever heard, if you ever knew someone who had diabetes, who had a painful small fiber neuropathy, they might be complaining of burning sensations in their hands and feet. That's due to a sensory small fiber neuropathy, but they could also have an autonomic small fiber neuropathy, which doesn't cause pain, but can cause all of the symptoms of dysautonomia that were listed on the back last page. So then we have this other group of conditions that are considered forms of dysautonomia or that are associated with dysautonomic symptoms, but they're not really well understood by medicine, so they still get labeled as like syndromes. Um, I put a little dashed line between the syndromes and the small fiber neuropathies because almost all of these syndromic conditions have been associated with small fiber neuropathy in a good subset of the patient population that has the diagnosis. So as, as, um, as more research happens, um, diagnoses shift from the sort of mystery syndrome section of this chart over to the known pathology section of the chart. So the disorder I would focus on um, the most in, within the dysautonomias right now is um, something called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. POTS is a form of dysautonomia. It's a form of orthostatic intolerance. P so people who have POTS have difficulty standing upright. And the reason I'm focusing on this is because I've, um, I, I think I had COVID back in February and I had some long-term symptoms. So I had joined some of the long haul groups and Survivor Corps. There's a couple of really great groups that are getting active on Facebook and organizing the patient community. So I had joined and I kept seeing so many patients talking about symptoms that sounded a whole lot like POTS. Um, that's actually how I started talking to Dr. Miglis about doing this webinar and a, a study that we're gonna be working on because the, the number of patients talking about this on the long haul groups was really, really extraordinary. So I don't wanna say everyone who has uh, a lot of tachycardia right now with COVID is, has POTS, but I think it's important for the COVID community to know about POTS and the, the broader context of uh, what pot, POTS falls under. So POTS has a specific diagnostic criteria. It's not just everyone who has tachycardia on standing. Um, unfortunately, there are some doctors who don't really follow the criteria and they, they kind of give that diagnosis out to a lot of people who maybe have something a little different. And there's also a lot of doctors who really have no clue about POTS and they completely miss the diagnosis. So um, you're at risk of being overdiagnosed and underdiagnosed due to a lack of physician education. But sometimes bringing that education directly to the patients and having them um, speak to their doctors about it is one way to find out if this is what your, your symptoms are caused by. So POTS patients have an abnormal increase in their heart rate over 30 beats per minute uh, higher when they're standing up than when they're laying down. So if you're laying down and your heart rate is 70, um, in someone who has POTS, they would stand up and their heart rate would go to well over 100. It's often 120, 140, just from standing still. In children, um, it would be uh, a higher requirement of a 40 BPM or more in adolescence. POTS rarely occurs uh, before puberty. There are some very young pediatric patients, but it's extremely uncommon. The peak age of onset is actually age 14, and half of people develop POTS in adulthood. Um, as I'll mention in a little bit, um, the reason this is also relevant is because 50% of people who develop POTS develop it after a viral infection. And it isn't any one specific viral infection that's associated with POTS. It's pretty much any infection you've ever heard of. There's someone with, with that infection that somehow developed POTS after their infection. It's also bacterial infections um, and other triggering um, there seem to be other triggers like pregnancy or car accidents. Anytime the body is undergoing um, some extreme stress. Um, I don't mean necessarily emotional stress. Obviously getting sick with COVID is, is an emotional thing, but it is not um, that kind of stress that we're talking about, like immunological stress or an injury to your nerve tissue type of stress. So um, the other thing about POTS is that we don't want to diagnose POTS when people have orthostatic hypotension, which is another specific type of dysautonomia. 
and it's technically it's a more orthostatic hypotension is a more severe form of dysautonomia. So you don't want to get misdiagnosed with POTS if you actually have orthostatic hypotension. So the way that orthostatic hypotension is ruled out is that you check the patient's blood pressure laying down and then standing up at three minutes. And if their blood pressure hasn't dropped a certain degree, then they don't have orthostatic hypotension. Um, there, in POTS, there have to be symptoms of orthostatic intolerance lasting um, six months or longer. Some, sorry, my slide just changed on me. Uh, six months or longer. Some doctors will say three months or longer. Um, sort of debated in the literature whether it's three months or six months. But for the most part, um, people who have this at three months generally still have it at six months. So I don't know why they're still debating about the time frame, but um, the symptoms that you get are like lightheadedness and shortness of breath on standing, the tachycardia on standing. Most of these symptoms will improve if the patient lays down, but not all POTS symptoms improve when, when the patient lays down. They, they, uh, we have some research showing that um, POTS patients have cognitive impairment, which some people call brain fog, and that doesn't always improve when they lay down. Um, that's something beyond just an orthostatic problem that's going on. And a lot of POTS patients will have GI dysmotility that isn't necessarily connected to whether they're standing upright or not. Um, we also want to rule out other overt causes of orthostatic symptoms or tachycardia. So, for example, if someone has hyperthyroidism, they can have a lot of tachycardia from that. And we wouldn't want to tell them they had POTS and miss their actual thyroid disorder, which is treatable in a different type of way. So you want to make sure you've had a good workup to sort of rule out other known causes of these types of symptoms before a doctor tells you you have POTS. Um, I also wanted to mention, if you don't meet the official POTS criteria, but you have all the symptoms and you, you have an orthostatic problem, there is another diagnosis that is used. It's called orthostatic intolerance. So I would say, I don't know if Dr. Miglis agrees, but I would say POTS and orthostatic intolerance are essentially the same thing. One has a specific diagnostic cutoff that's an you know, objective diagnostic criteria, and orthostatic intolerance is sort of like where we put everyone else that doesn't fit into another category. But they're essentially treated the same way, and a lot of the known physiology is the same as well. So POTS patients will have a pronounced tachycardia, which is a fast heart rate when they stand up. They might have palpitations, sort of a feeling of their heart skipping, shortness of breath, uh, laying down and standing, lightheadedness. Um, but the term presyncope means um, the sensation that you that you get right before you feel like you're about to faint. So if you've never fainted, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. But if you've ever fainted, especially while standing up, you might have noticed that you got kind of all sweaty and clammy and a, and a nauseous kind of feeling, maybe a headache, um, and felt kind of jittery. That's a, a presyncope sensation, and it's kind of unpleasant. Um, so about a third of POTS patients, or, or 20 to 30 percent, um, have actual syncope, which is the medical term for fainting, but not all of them do. Some of them just get that presyncope sensation fairly often. GI dysmotility, nausea is a big thing in POTS, <clears throat> bladder dysfunction in a minority of patients, sensitivity to heat and light, uh, sensitivity to noise, migraines are like 90% of POTS patients have migraines, profound fatigue. Um, there is a, there's a definite overlap between POTS and chronic fatigue syndrome. I often wonder whether we're actually studying the same disease, but there's just two different fields of researchers and they don't talk to each other as much as we want them to, which is something we're trying to do as an organization, get the, the POTS and the CFS researchers to hang out more often. Um, a, a weakness sensation, it's not due to a motor nerve weakness, but more due to um, probably abnormal blood flow that makes the muscles less efficient and makes you feel weak. Tremulousness is sort of a shaking, a, a weird sort of internal shaking feeling. Exercise intolerance, obviously, if you're having trouble standing up without feeling lightheaded, it's going to be really hard to exercise. Dependent acrocyanosis, I'll show you on another slide. It just means um, purple POTS legs. Flushing, which tends to be upper body. And then a lot of patients will develop increased food, drug, environmental uh, sensitivities and allergies. 
And I'm noticing on the COVID support groups that a lot of you are talking about that. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about mast cells. So interestingly, um, a good subset of POTS patients have a mast cell activation syndrome diagnosis. And the autonomic nervous system regulates mast cells and, and controls um, their proclivity to degranulate or not. So we don't fully understand this POTS mast cell relationship in POTS. So I can't tell you we understand anything about it in COVID, but um, there are immunologists that are thinking about this already. As I mentioned before, 50% of POTS patients have a post-viral onset, um, other, other potential triggers. And while POTS seems sort of like a benign kind of um, term, the disability in POTS, even though it's mostly young people that get it, uh, the disability is similar to what's seen in heart failure and COPD, which is, you know, pretty very debilitating. These are the purple POTS legs I was talking about. Um, uh, not every POTS patient gets this, but a lot of them do, and it's it's due to some abnormal circulation in their uh, lower body, uh, particularly when they're upright. Coat hanger pain is common in uh, a lot of autonomic disorders because it's due we think, to poor blood flow to the large muscles in the upper back and neck. Um, when you're upright, if you're not getting good blood flow to the upper half of your body because you have this orthostatic problem, you can get a lot of lactic acid buildup in your muscles in your uh, back and neck, and it can be quite painful. So I do want to give an important word of caution to everyone, um, especially um, those of you who are seeking out doctors you know, to sort of begin new treatments for this. It's really important that you don't just assume your symptoms are due to POTS or another form of dysautonomia because COVID can cause some very serious complications that cause similar symptoms. So these complications in COVID are not um, what a majority of COVID patients experience, but they're severe enough and, and sort of dangerous enough that you need to make sure you've spoken to a doctor and ruled out um, potentially dangerous underlying mechanisms before you start doing the things that are used to treat POTS and, and orthostatic disorders. So myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle, pericarditis, which is inflammation of the lining of the heart, cardiomyopathy, which is damage to the heart muscle, heart failure, cardiac rhythm disorders, lung damage, pulmonary embolism is a, a blood clot in your lungs, um, general blood clots elsewhere, or stroke, these can all cause symptoms very similar to a dysautonomia. You would not want to treat someone who has heart failure the way that we treat dysautonomia. So super important. Really, you should be able to get this type of stuff ruled out with just a visit to a cardiologist or a pulmonologist. Um, okay. And then something else. This is the sort of, I mentioned deconditioning earlier. Um, deconditioning is a sort of a tricky topic in POTS and uh, in dysautonomias as a whole. But in terms of COVID, um, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that deconditioning can happen to anyone, even super athletic people who have never been sick before, they can get deconditioned really quickly. So even if you just spent a few days vegging out on the couch or laying in bed when you have this virus, um, you can very quickly lose some of your cardiac function. So the good news is if you have deconditioning, it's fixable. The bad news is it's actually really hard to get reconditioned if you've become deconditioned due to um, you know, an, an infection or a surgery. If anyone's ever had like major back surgery or something, you know that just a, you know, a week of laying in bed, you really feel kind of awful when you try to get up out of bed again. And so deconditioning symptoms can look a lot like dysautonomia symptoms. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole list here, but it's it's basically the same symptoms. So you ha it's very hard for your doctors to know, is this definitely a dysautonomia or is this a deconditioning? And quite often, it can be both. Um, a I would say most people who have a dysautonomia do develop a deconditioning. So here's a sort of a little diagram to help explain it. Let's say you've gotten a virus, COVID, and at some point that virus um, had you most likely, you know, laying in bed for a few days or laying on the couch or just reducing your normal daily activities. So you had some reduced exercise and activity um, action. And you then you also possibly had some um, 
viral impact on your autonomic nerves directly. I don't know that for sure because we don't have the research proving that at this moment, but let's just say hypothetically that's what's what's happened in a subset of patients. So whether it was actual autonomic neuropathy or reduced exercise, either way that can lead to deconditioning and deconditioning can lead to worsening dysautonomia like symptoms. Um, so it's sort of like a vicious cycle. And so how can we cut off this cycle at some point and sort of get you out of this negative feedback loop? So these are the standard treatments used for POTS and orthostatic intolerance, the, the non-pharmacological treatments, which are generally benign. Um, before starting any new treatments, I would definitely speak with your physicians. We don't want, if you have a kidney problem or a heart problem, we probably don't want to be telling you to increase your salt intake. But um, these are things you could talk about with your physician. Lots of lots of salt, um, hydrating fluids daily, medical grade compression stockings, abdominal compression, recumbent, like reclined exercises. Because if you try to exercise upright, like running, you're putting yourself under orthostatic stress. But if you do laying down exercises, you should be better able to tolerate them. It seems kind of silly to say it, but you know, manage your stress, good sleep habits, healthy diet. And what is a healthy diet? Well, that's different for all of us. But I think in general, you know, avoiding processed junk food and trying to eat lots of fruits and vegetables. If if you eat meat, eat, you know, lean proteins, healthy, basically try to avoid the junk. Whenever you're trying to heal your body from an injury or an infection, you really want to be as healthy as you can in your uh, in your diet. Cooling vests, this is good if you have um, temperature sensitivity, heat intolerance. You can buy different cooling devices to help you sustain your sustain your activity longer in a in especially in a hot summer environment. You might want to avoid really hot places like you might want to skip hot yoga for now if you think you might have a dysautonomia because it could make it worse. Um, prolonged standing, sometimes standing in line at the grocery store is really difficult for these patients. Good thing we have curbside pickup in many areas right now. Um, Hot showers can be a trigger, so you might want to take a cooler shower or a shorter shower. Um, also showering right before bed, because if you're going to get lightheaded and dizzy from showering, you might as well do it right before bed, and it'll help you fall asleep. Um, some patients can tolerate alcohol, but I would say for the most part, you should probably avoid alcohol if you're having some long-lasting COVID symptoms, because um, alcohol is generally not good for anyone who has like a neuropathy or a neurological problem. Um, so you know, probably skip the white claw for now. <laughs> um, and then just listening to your body. You know, if you're trying to push yourself to exercise, but it just feels like it's way too much and it's making you worse, then you need to um, pull back and sort of be really in tune with, with how you're responding to different things you try. A little more on the exercise therapy. You wanna go slow and low. These are some reclined, recumbent things you could do. Swimming, I would only do if you're not a fainter or do it supervised if you are a fainter. Um, floor exercises, toning up your core and your legs can be really helpful. And you go slow. There are some people, I can tell you, I, I started out in this field as a patient and I was bedridden for two years before I was accurately diagnosed with my autonomic disorder. And rehabbing myself from the deconditioned state I was in was probably the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Um, and it took a long time. So especially if you've been an athletic person in the past, you're you have that mental fortitude to push through and push, push, push. And sometimes that isn't the right thing to do when you have a dysautonomia. You have to take it uh, slow. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Just in case you didn't hear me, hydrate. <laughs> this is super important for everyone um, who has a, a dysautonomia and really just good for, for humans in general to be well hydrated. You want to avoid things like alcohol. Sugary drinks are kind of dehydrating. Caffeine is kind of dehydrating. Um, some people get a little too nauseous with just water. I do want to say if you drink a lot of water, like if you drink a gallon of water, you need to make sure you're getting enough salt too because you can actually be flushing out your electrolytes and making yourself a little bit more dizzy than if you had uh, enough salt with your fluids. Speaking of salt, um, here's some different creative ways you can get your salt if you don't wanna, we're, we're all told all the time not to salt our foods, but if you have some low blood pressure or some pots, you're going to want to increase your salt intake if your doctor says okay. 
V8, bullion, um, all the fancy salts you can buy are pretty much salt is salt, but if you get bored eating plain table salt, you can um, kind of experiment with different flavors. Soy sauce on everything, learn to love pickles. Um, the people who have dysautonomia are the masters of finding ways to salt your food without ruining the taste. <laughs> Uh, so compression garments, they are for men and women. Um, if you don't want to wear traditional stockings, they do sell a lot of uh, like athletic compression gear now. It's not necessarily as effective as real medical compression stockings. If you do get stockings, um, your insurance in the U.S. might cover it if you have a prescription for orthostatic hypotension as a durable medical good. And um, you want to get the 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury compression that's really gonna be something that's, it's really tight, but you can get it on and off. Tight, there are tighter ones, but they're almost impossible to get on and off. And then there are looser ones that are not highly effective in, in providing the compression benefit. They have colors now, and um, abdominal compression is probably more helpful. You see a lot of people using uh, knee highs, like compression socks. Most of your blood when you stand up doesn't go to your calves. It goes to your thighs and your belly area. So a good pair of Spanx are probably more helpful than those compression socks. And I know the guys probably aren't too excited about wearing Spanx, but they do make man versions of these things. Um, so what are the drug treatments? So if, if all of those um, lifestyle and non-pharma treatments don't work, we have a couple of um, different classes of drugs that are used to pharmacologically manage POTS and orthostatic intolerance. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on these, but the, the broad categories are vasoconstrictors, so, so drugs that squeeze your blood vessels and help the blood get back up to your heart and brain. Um, Sudafed PE is on this list, but is not something you should use on a regular basis. It's sort of like a, if you're on vacation and you forgot your minadrine, you could, you could probably swap it out for a Sudafed PE for a day or two, but that should not be used as a long-term um, vasoconstrictor. Blood volume expansion, so the whole idea of salt and fluids is to expand your blood volume. People with POTS tend to have low blood volume. People with deconditioning also tend to have low blood volume. Fludrocortisone um, is the drug most often used um, to, to help uh, pharmacologically with blood volume expansion, but it really only works if you increase your salt and fluids as well. Beta blockers are used to slow down the heart rate if you have low blood pressure, sometimes beta blockers can make that worse. So there's another option called Ivabradine, which um, is a drug that doesn't drop your blood pressure but can lower the heart rate. Uh, Mestinon is a drug that increases your parasympathetic nervous system activity, uh, which can be helpful for some patients. So there's immunotherapy question mark because um, there's some indication that POTS itself might be an autoimmune disease or an autoimmune process in a subset of patients. That's, that's ongoing, fairly new research. And so there is an immunotherapy clinical trial happening. Um, there probably isn't, there really aren't many doctors who would routinely, I don't know any doctor who would routinely recommend, recommend immunotherapy for POTS. Um, but sometimes in rare cases when patients have tried all of the other treatments and there's a pretty obvious immunological problem happening, um, doctors might try to use IVIG on them. And as I mentioned earlier, a subset of POTS patients have mast cell activation syndrome. So um, these are sort of the, the standard medications that might be used. H1 and H2 blockers are like Zyrtec and Benadryl. Um, oral chromalin is used sometimes, um, which is an old asthma drug. And then in more severe cases that can't be managed with um, sort of diet and antihistamines, you might have doctors using Zolaire. Uh, quercetin and vitamin C are both over-the-counter supplements, which are pretty benign and can help, um, at least the research says, they can help stabilize mast cells a little bit. So, wait, I got lost. There we go. So post-viral dysautonomia or post-viral deconditioning, whichever it may be, it's really important, I want everyone to hear it. It's not in your head. These are well-known phenomena that are well-documented in the medical literature. Um, despite existing since the dawn of time, you know, I'm sure ever since people have been upright on two feet, there probably have been people who've been fainting and having trouble staying upright on two feet. But doctors, many doctors are not 
well educated on these conditions. So it's really common for people with dysautonomia or POTS or, or any kind of post viral syndrome, whether that's um, fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, anything to be told, oh, this is all in your head. And it's really not, but it's just due to um, a lack of clinician education. So you're not alone. There are lots of people who have these illnesses. And the good news is that some people fully recover. Some, I'd say probably the majority improve over time and some people don't. So I, I think, this, uh, you know, we should be honest. We don't know what COVID, long haul COVID is. We don't know if this is a six month illness or an, an eight month illness or a forever illness. We don't know. So I think that um, we should be honest with, with patients about that. So in case you were wondering um, if, if anyone else has been told ridiculous things by their doctors, this is what I was told. Just wanted to add a personal anecdote. When I was misdiagnosed, I was told, oh, you're just hung over. On the first day I was sick. Uh, the second day I was told, maybe you weren't cut out to be a lawyer, just go home and have a glass of red wine to relax. So it's kind of funny, one doctor was telling me I was a drunk and the other one was telling me I should drink. <laughs> Um, and then the best of all was the doctor who said, you're just doing this because you're 31 and don't have babies yet. And you're trying to get attention from your husband. I, I, he's very lucky that I was bedridden because I almost threw him across the hospital room. And then I was told you're deconditioned because lawyers just sit at their desks all day. So that was pretty frustrating to hear because sitting at my desk was not something I did a lot of. <laughs> I was a super athletic person before I got sick. The um, trapeze class on the bottom of this slide was like, about a week before I got sick, I was doing trapeze class in New York City. So you're not alone if you've been told it's all in your head or, or somehow blamed for your symptoms. Try not to let it uh, get to you. Don't waste emotional or physical energy on that. That's just um, a doctor not really being up to par on what they need to know about this. So keep searching, find a good doctor. Um, the Dysautonomia International website has a list of dysautonomia doctors, but there aren't a lot of them and most of them have very long wait lists. So I would suggest um, as much as you can, trying to work with your local primary care doctor, your, your infectious disease doctor, or even um, a local cardiologist or electrophysiologist. So Dr. Miglitz and I are working on a study. Uh, we were hoping to have it ready to launch um, on this webinar, but we have you know, some additional paperwork to do at Stanford and Stony Brook. Um, but it'll be a survey tracking uh, long haul COVID patients long term to see who recovers, who doesn't recover, how do symptoms evolve over time, and then hopefully eventually digging into um, you know what treatments are effective so we can so we can advise people on that. So um, you can sign up to get an email uh, if you'd like to be find out when the study is recruiting it, at um, bitly slash long haul study. And I will make sure that when we, e we'll email this video to everyone who registered for the webinar, and we'll make sure to put a link for that um, sign up in there. So that's the end of my slides. Dr. Miglis, are you with us? I'm here. Oh, thank goodness, okay. <laughs> I went on long because I wasn't sure if you were there or not. I'm here. Um, so these are just some resources from Dysautonomy International, and we have the same resources in one of the handouts that you should be able to download from the webinar. So. Um, you don't need to spend too much time on this slide because it's one of the handouts. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Miglis to present his slides. So uh, so that was very comprehensive. It pretty much covered most of what I had. So um, I can be brief and um, and allow some time for questions. So, so I'm a neurologist. Uh, I specialize in autonomic disorders. Um, as Lauren pointed out, most of these disorders are poorly understood, and a lot of them are still considered syndromes. Um, POTS is a syndrome, which means we have just only started by describing the disease, and we still don't understand the mechanism of what causes it. And and that's going to be the same with, I think, our understanding of COVID. You know, we're still in very early understanding of this disease and, and just still um, describing what we see. And then, you know, the long-term effects are only going to be evident as we do studies you know, over over the next year or two years. So uh, my interest in this, uh, of course, comes from seeing patients. And um, so, you know, I'll start with a case. And this is a patient that we did autonomic testing on just last week. And so this was um, a 26-year-old emergency department nurse who just had some mild asthma um, in the past, 
otherwise very healthy and developed uh, COVID with initially symptoms of cough and some shortness of breath. And then um, some symptoms that we hear commonly in patients with POTS with chest pain and burning when she's taking deep breaths, palpitations, and, and racing heart. And um, she started being woken at night with, with their racing heart. Um, she eventually developed orthostatic intolerance that, that Lauren mentioned and progressive fatigue. So interestingly, on day, on day 10 of the symptoms, she had a nasal swab, which was negative, um, but then went back the next day and they re-swabbed her and she was positive. Um, which is a little scary and also points out, you know, some of the inconsistencies with, with testing. Um, and then over time, over the next several months, she developed more of um, high, high blood pressure when she'd stand with blood pressures going into the 150s when previously her blood pressures were in the 110s and her heart rate would go to the 140s, 160s. And so um, we, you know, it sounded, it sounded like POTS. Um, we, um, brought her in and did a tilt table test. And, you know, this test isn't something that all patients need. This is an important point that a lot of the times um, you, can, you can diagnose disorders of orthostatic intolerance like POTS or orthostatic hypotension with just um, a home blood, arm blood pressure cuff and uh, just doing the measurements yourself at home. And uh, Lauren included, I think, in our um, supplements here, there's an orthostatic log that, that you can use to check this at home yourself. Um, but if the numbers are, are, are normal and we're a little suspicious, sometimes the tilt will bring out abnormalities that a home orthostatic stand test will not. Um, so, you know, we measure the, the blood pressure on the finger, so it gives a continuous curve and uh, it gives us the heart rate and the blood pressure. And uh, we bring patients up to this, this angle of 70 degrees for about 10 minutes and see what their blood pressure and heart rate does. And so this is what her blood pressure and heart rate look like on the tilt. Um, the red lines here uh, indicate when she was upright on the tilt. So the first part of the graph is, is laying flat. And then, you know, the, in, in between the red bars is at 70 degrees. And um, her heart rate went up by a, a max of 65 points, as Lauren mentioned, normal increase in heart rate shouldn't be more than 30 points if you're an adult. And um, her blood pressure, importantly, did not drop. So we always make that distinction. So she did not have orthostatic hypotension, but she had this exaggerated tachycardia. And actually, her blood pressure increased um, a little bit, which um, kind of went along with some of her symptoms of more of like a heightened adrenaline fight or flight response. And uh, so, so we ended up diagnosing her with POTS. And the interesting, of course, this is only uh, one case, um, but uh, it, this is interesting in the context of POTS commonly being reported after viral infections. And um, now we have a very distinct virus um, that we can test for. And um, part of our research and hopefully understanding of all this is to see you know, what the prevalence of disorders of autonomic function like POTS are after, uh, after COVID. Um, a little bit scary and also interesting though, we repeated her, um, her so she had antibody testing initially and she was positive on the blood test. We repeated her antibodies and she's negative. Um, so sometimes the antibody test is not really well understood, but some um, people feel like the antibodies may, may decrease over time and the test may not pick it up. So, um, so Lauren already went over the, the diagnostic criteria. I won't belabor this. Uh, so, so we diagnosed her with postural tachycardia syndrome. And this just further emphasizes the point that in POTS, the abnormality is more in the heart rate going up, but the blood pressure should not drop. If the blood pressure drops, it's probably a more severe disorder called orthostatic hypotension. Uh, this indicates that there's more of an autonomic failure uh, going on, uh, and, and this can be seen in some post-viral syndromes um, in which, which there's a strong immunological response that actually damages the autonomic nerves. And um, it's, it's a very different sort of presentation typically from POTS, whereas um, POTS is more of a disorder of um, sympathetic activation, and this is more of a disorder of sympathetic failure. 
Uh, so Lauren already talked about this, the orthostatic uh, intolerance symptoms, so I won't belabor that, um, and all the associated symptoms of POTS. So, you know, POTS is not a new disease, and, and post-viral syndromes are not uh, new diseases. So this goes, you know, back into the 1870s, where, um, you know, even reports of the Civil War, um, sorry, excuse me. So this goes back to like reports in the Civil War um, after um, intestinal infections. There are reports of, of POTS uh, in, in the literature, and this was described as DaCosta syndrome. And in the, in the 20s in Sweden, there's there the same description. Um, it was only in 1993 when the current um, diagnostic criteria were proposed at a Mayo Clinic, and those are the same criteria we use today. Uh, those criteria rely on the heart rate as the predominant feature, but as, as Lauren pointed out, a lot of patients um, may have all the symptoms of POTS but not have that 30-beat increase on standing, and they, they, do have a, they do have a disease, but we, we sometimes can't give them the, the diagnosis of POTS. I think it just speaks to the fact that the, the heart rate is just one of the only things we can um, we can track and follow, but it may not reflect the underlying severity of the disease. And so we won't go through all of the mechanisms. The fact that there's so many here just proves that we don't understand this disease. But uh, as more research has been done in POTS, um, we are realizing that there are um, more and more features of autoimmunity, or at least immune dysregulation in POTS. And there have now been um, three separate groups of researchers in three uh, uh, different areas of the country, even internationally, that have demonstrated that patients with POTS have increased antibodies against certain autonomic receptors. Um, and again, we won't belabor the details here, but um, suffice it to say that uh, patients with POTS you know, have these strong features of autoimmunity with these certain antibodies. and um, and they seem to be targeting receptors in the autonomic nerves, uh, what are called adrenergic and beta uh, and muscarinic receptors that are responsible for regulating heart rate and regulating blood pressure. And so f there are several studies ongoing in this. And, um, and this is one you know, as association with this post-viral sort of mechanism um, that uh, even post-viral syndromes are thought to be due to some dysregulation of the immune system. You know, and chronic fatigue syndrome is a good example of that. Now, I'm, I'm not a specialist in chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, this is admittedly not my expertise, but, you know, in autonomic disorders, we have to become at least familiar with some of these, uh, some of the literature because, um, you know, there aren't, there aren't many physicians that are, you know, actively interested in, in treating a lot of these disorders. Um, and so just in looking through the through literature on post-infectious autonomic syndromes, um, most of the literature is focused on sort of the acute phase, you know, within three or six months of the illness. And uh, we don't have a lot of long-term follow-up. Part of the reason for that is because um, a lot of the uh, the, the research is anecdotal um, because we're all exposed to viruses daily and uh, there's so many potential viral causes for, for disease that it's, it's almost impossible when we're seeing patients several years after their, their illness onset to actually isolate, you know, the infectious trigger because it's long gone. Um, in COVID, we now have a known infection and a known timestamp of infection, you know, if, if patients are PCR tested. Um, so this is, this hopefully will inform a lot of uh, the understanding of these, these conditions. But basically, as Lauren mentioned, the type of infection doesn't matter, doesn't seem to matter. Um, anything from virus to bacterial to, to parasites have triggered post-infectious autonomic syndromes. And, um, this is from one study in POTS where they saw 28% of patients had a preceding illness. Um, you know, in another paper, like Lauren mentioned, 50% of patients. So it's something that we see frequently. 
we'll just skip over this. And, you know, and just preparing a bit for this talk, I was just looking back into other post post viral um, neurological conditions, you know, and there are many and they've, it's been happening ever since um, neurologists have been have been recording um, uh, these conditions. And if anyone's seen the film Awakenings, you know, this, this post-encephalitis lethargica uh, was thought to be due to a virus. It's actually unknown which virus it was, but um, a lot of people believe it was an en enterovirus. And, um, you know, some of these conditions were much more severe than COVID, you know, with mortality up to 50%. Um, and in those who did survive, there could be this very chronic form uh, decades later where patients would develop uh, like a Parkinson's syndrome uh, with psychiatric disorders. Um, this paper I thought was interesting. This is cited more in the chronic fatigue syndrome literature that sort of emphasizes the type of infection, the type of virus doesn't really matter. Um, the, the incidence of chronic fatigue syndrome is very similar across different viruses. And in this particular study, they had access to an entire community in Australia where they were able to uh, interview all residents who had a positive viral titer of any infection who saw their primary doctor. And then they followed them over a year. And they found that up to 11% um, of this population met the diagnostic criteria of chronic fatigue syndrome. And so uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a rare thing to have persistent fatigue after a viral infection. And so again, because there's, there's not much literature to go on when we're talking about um, COVID-19 um, post, post viral syndromes, uh, we can look back to the two other coronavirus um, um, outbreaks, uh, SARS back in 2002, and um, you know, a much smaller uh, number of cases. So SARS was only 800 for, uh, 8,439 cases. It did have a higher mortality than COVID, 10% uh, mortality. Um, there are only a couple studies that I could find that looked at long-term data in survivors. Um, but this one study, this Moldovsky study, um, was is the most cited study, and they looked at survivors after about three years and found that a good percentage of them had a chronic fatigue-like illness with um, non-restorative sleep, fibromyalgia pains, and, um, and some of them had persistent abnormalities in their pulmonary function at six months. And so that's another unanswered question, especially with, with lung involvement in COVID, is if, if some of these autonomic symptoms and deconditioning could be due to uh, you know, either fibrosis of the lungs or persistent abnormalities with oxygen uh, diffusion. And so another small study in SARS patients that they did autonomic testing on, only 14 patients, um, four of those had abnormalities on the orthostatic component. And um, all, of, all of these patients, of course, it's a referral sort of bias, but all of them did have chronic fatigue. If we looked at, at MERS, um, even smaller number of cases, you know, about 2,500 cases, much higher mortality rates, 35%, um, much less literature on chronic forms. And there's no literature I could find on autonomic dysfunction, although there were reports of sensory neuropathy, which in our mind, you know, always makes us question an autonomic component because a lot of sensory neuropathies can cause um, autonomic impairment, especially if they're post-infectious. Um, and there, there were reports of Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is, which is a well-understood a well sort of um, post-infectious inflammatory disease of the nerves in which um, there's thought to be a form of molecular mimicry because of the body is fighting off the, the virus, it develops antibodies um, that end up attacking and damaging the nerves. And so, this, you know, is another possibility in, in other coronaviruses like COVID. So just looking at the numbers, you know, those other uh, coronavirus um, epidemics were in the thousands. These numbers were just from last night. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 number of cases, confirmed cases worldwide, from what I could see, was 16.1 million. Uh, so 
the numbers are logarithmically, you know, exponentially higher uh, for COVID-19. So I think whatever was seen in small uh, cases back then in those other uh, outbreaks, um, we're going to see in, in, in a big way, uh, you know, in the next six to 12 months and, and longer. Um, this virus has a lower mortality rate, so that means that more, most patients will survive. Um, however, the long-term outcomes are still unclear. And this was just one article that I found uh, published just um, June 1st, looking at neurology patients out of Spain. And these are all hospitalized patients, so more severe cases. 39% um, of them uh, were in, uh, considered severe, 9% were, were in the ICU. and over 50% developed neurological symptoms. 20% of those had loss of consciousness as one of the most common symptoms. And it's unclear if this virus can enter uh, the brain. Um, that's not been established yet, but there are um, ACE receptors in the brain stem that do control um, blood pressure and so, you know, this is one possibility. Um, another 2.5% had dysautonomia, although this wasn't really defined in the paper. But um, the authors in their conclusions, you know, stated that dysautonomia is suggestive of COVID-19 affecting the small unmyelinated fibers that Lauren uh, mentioned, these small, small fibers. Uh, nevertheless, the central origin of dysautonomia cannot be excluded Unlike that seen in the central nervous system, um, there's no evidence that SARS-CoV is capable of directly damaging the peripheral nerves. It seems more likely that the damage is exerted indirectly by a cytokine storm due to a disimmune mechanism. And that's that's you know our thinking. And when we see most patients with post-viral syndromes, um, the virus is long gone by the time we're seeing patients, and the damage is. Uh, most likely caused by a continued um, aggravation or um, uh, dysregulation of the immune system. And in, in other reports of postural tachycardia syndrome and also chronic fatigue syndrome, we do see that there are indirect, there is indirect evidence of this with elevated inflammatory cytokines, a lot of the same cytokines that are enhanced in the early form of the illness. Um, so a lot of unanswered questions, but we're hoping that through future studies and um, including starting with survey studies like uh, we'll be doing, um, you know, with your help, we'll understand uh, or understand these conditions better and, and, and lead to better treatments. So we'll stop there just a little over an hour if, uh, if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Miglis. There are a lot of questions. We probably won't be able to get to every single one of them, but I will try to pull out some of the more um, common things people are asking about. So one, um, Dr. Miglis, could you explain how people would do orthostatic vitals if they were gonna fill out that chart? Like how long do you wait to stand up to check, uh, to look for orthostatic hypotension or an orthostatic mm -hmm. tachycardia? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so first, uh, we always recommend to start with the first reading um, laying flat, completely flat. Uh, you can do it sitting, but um, laying flat, you're always going to see uh, the greatest magnitude of change. And so um, I would say lay flat for a minute. A minute is fine. Check your blood pressure and heart rate, then stand up and remain standing for two to three minutes and then check it again. And the reason for that is it's normal to have an initial drop in your blood pressure or a spike in your heart rate. Uh, that should normalize within, you know, 10 to 30 seconds, but it's not normal if it, it persists for, you know, up to three minutes. Okay. Um, I just want to add to that. If your doctor is screening you, it should probably be more than three minutes because the POTS test, like a standing test to look for POTS, is within 10 minutes, right? So I've seen right. COVID patients talking about their doctors doing orthostatic vitals, and they said, my doctor checked me sitting and standing, and he only waited 30 seconds in between, so therefore he didn't pick anything up. Um, so 
I would think that what you do at home is a little bit more casual than what you would expect from your doctor. And it, that's true. It's, it's rare to see the abnormality um, begin after three minutes, which is usually why I tell patients to do it up to three minutes. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's common that it will continue to worsen after three minutes, but you're usually going to see it within that two to three minute uh, window. Okay. Next question is, is nerve pain in the feet connected? And um, if there are COVID patients having a lot of tingling in hands and feet, is, is that somehow related? I know what your answer is going to be, but I'm asking it to you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the answer to all this is we really don't know, but um, there is precedent, again, in other uh, what we presume to be post-viral uh, syndromes. Um, and so sensory complaints are very common. And it's, if it's just the feet, you know, one follow-up question would be, is it, does it happen mostly when you stand? If so, it could be due to, you know, more of a, a vascular, uh, you know, blood pooling phenomenon, or if it's there independent of position, then we think more of a, a neuropathy. And these small fiber neuropathies, which have been associated with uh, viral infections, um, can manifest with exactly those kinds of symptoms. Okay. Um, so someone's asking, are, is chest tightness and shortness of breath possibly due to dysautonomia? Um, they've had numerous um, clear chest x-rays and they're having this symptom and they're wondering if it is, could it be related to deconditioning or dysautonomia or is it, or is that more of a straight up COVID problem? Yeah. Um, a follow-up the question would be again: Is it related to standing or or exertion? Is it related to orthostatic challenge? Um, that's that's always what we're trying to get at to help to help us determine if it's if it's autonomic. Um, of course, there are many autonomic symptoms that are unrelated to posture, but if it is more of a um, blood pressure or heart rate issue, it's it's almost always going to be worse when you're upright. Um, but it could very well be due to the inflammatory process that the virus produces in the lungs. And that, you know, is admittedly not my expertise. And um, I think that even uh, specialists in that, we don't understand. Uh, we don't understand the long-term pulmonary complications yet. Yeah. Uh, a few people have asked, what is the best type of doctor to see to talk to about dysautonomia? So I would say, um, in a not snarky way, the doctor that will work with you and listen to you is the best doctor to find. It doesn't really matter what discipline they are. But generally speaking, um, a cardiologist, an electrophysiologist, or a neurologist, but that doesn't mean they're all going to have uh, be helpful because there's a lot of doctors who just don't get it. I would have said um, to other patients in, in the dysautonomia community, if you can find an autonomic neurologist like Dr. Miglis, that's great because they're going to have that expertise. There are not a lot of them in the whole country. There's probably less than 40. Um, there are neurologists who specialize in neuromuscular disorders, and they tend to have a better understanding of small fiber neuropathies and, and the autonomic consequences of that. So um, probably not a like a neurologist who specializes in stroke isn't necessarily the same type of neurologist that specializes in neuromuscular disorders. So sort of poke around for a neuromuscular specialist. Um, and then uh, any electrophysiologist who has a tilt table lab and um, does, um, you know, might have some expertise in fainting disorders might might also be helpful. Dr. Miglis, do you want to add to that? No, that's exact. That's perfect. That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would I would start with your primary care doctor if you can. It's always Sometimes the primary care doctors don't have the sort of big fancy expertise, but they know you and they hopefully understand that this is different than your your health in the past and therefore they should look into it a little bit. Um, someone asked, is there a difference between post-viral fatigue, post-viral deconditioning, and post-viral dysautonomia? You wanna take that one? <laughs> That's the million dollar <laughs> question, um, right? So, um, because Fatigue can cause deconditioning, can can cause dysautonomia, and um, you know sometimes one one way that we help answer that question in in patients we see, which again is is usually the POTS uh, 
um, patients is if there's symptoms, of, if it's from dysautonomia, usually there are other symptoms going on, um, like GI problems, um, you know, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, or uh, abnormalities with sweating, sweating too much or too little, or heat, cold intolerance, feeling like you're going to faint. Um, so there's there's typically other features of other systems involved if it's um, a more diffuse dysautonomia. But, um, you know, a, a lot of it is, I think chronic fatigue syndrome is, is a good example. A lot of times it's, it can be impossible to distinguish them. And, um, you know, orthostatic intolerance is actually one of the criteria of chronic fatigue syndrome. So, you know, as Lauren said, we might be dealing with the same thing. In a classic POTS autonomic case, exercise improves the symptoms. In a classic chronic fatigue syndrome case, exercise worsens the symptoms. But that being said, we're always trying to push all of our pac patients to exercise. So that's a way of talking around it and we don't understand it extremely well, but those are some little features that, at least in my mind, I can use to guide my thinking about it. I, I, as someone who was diagnosed with POTS and chronic fatigue syndrome and, and met the criteria for both and actually ended up having an underlying autoimmune disease that was kind of the root cause of everything for me, um, exercise most definitely made me feel worse, but I did it, I, I adjusted how I did it so that it was tolerable. And then over time, I was able to tolerate more if that like it's if you're truly bedridden and really deconditioned no matter what l amount of exercise you do even if it's just like walk to the bathroom today you're going to feel drained afterwards so i would be cautious about you know don't avoid exercise just because it makes you feel a little bit more crappy the next day um but think of the big picture. If that's ha if that's always happening and you're never ever starting to gain more tolerance, then you might have some other um, some other problem going on that isn't just a deconditioning related problem. If that does that make sense, Dr. Miglas? I'm like yeah. I don't it, exercise is not easy for any of these patients. Um, and so uh, someone, there's a question. Um, so we, we sort of advertised this webinar mostly to the COVID community because we wanted to sort of explain the basics of dysautonomia and POTS. But we did get um, some members of our existing um, dysautonomia community joining us. And so people are asking, um, does having POTS and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or mast cell activation syndrome sort of increase your risk for, um, you know, are you higher risk for COVID? So we've discussed this with our entire medical advisory board and a lot of other autonomic experts. And as far as we can tell right now, having an existing um, POTS like dysautonomic POTS or orthostatic intolerance isn't necessarily creating a greater risk for very severe COVID or anything like that. I'm sure there are definitely POTS patients who feel worse with every viral infection they get, which is probably because they have some kind of immunological thing going on that's causing their POTS. So if you have an immunological problem and you get a virus, you're you're likely to feel worse. Um, you know, your POTS will flare, so to speak. Um, but we don't we don't have any evidence that having an existing POTS or orthostatic intolerance diagnosis makes you more at risk for like dangerous COVID complications. There has been no research, but that's just anecdotal from talking to all the autonomic labs. So, Dr. Miglis, do you have any thoughts on that? Have you seen anybody with in your POTS clinics getting much worse? No, no, I, I would agree with all that. Um, you know, that being said, we, I don't have any of my patients that have had confirmed uh, COVID um, that I can think of. The few patients I've seen have been uh, previously healthy that have developed autonomic syndromes. Yeah, we um, we started an informal poll on one of the dysautonomy international support groups that has like 35,000 POTS patients in it. And we asked people, have you been confirmed with testing? Have you been confirmed by a doctor with no testing? Or do you suspect you had COVID with no doctor or testing confirmation? And then what, you know, after you tell us, you know, where you are in that um, that framework, you know, how have your symptoms, how are you doing? You know, did you end up in the hospital? Did you end up on oxygen? And the responses, there's been a lot of responses, because obviously when you have a group of 35,000 people, you're, you're going to have some people in that group who've been diagnosed with COVID. 
Um, and the responses for the most part is that people are having a pretty routine viral response to it. There were a handful of people who ended up in the hospital, sometimes people who had underlying um, immune deficiency diseases who have to always take extra precautions when they get a virus because they don't really have an immune system to fight it off. But we didn't see anything really shocking that made us say, oh my God, we need to put everybody on high alert. That being said, um, it, it makes perfect sense if you have any chronic illness to, to take the precautions that really everyone should be taking at this point. Um, and you know, wearing a mask and social distancing, washing your hands and all the, the usual stuff. Um, we do have a website, dysautonomiainternational.org slash coronavirus has information meant for existing dysautonomia patients to talking about the different risks that um, all the risk type questions patients were having. And we're working on building, um, building out a second piece of the website that is meant for COVID patients who wanna learn about dysautonomia. And this webinar will end up on that page. So um, uh, maybe we'll just do one or two more questions and then we'll uh, sign off. So what type of bladder dysfunction would someone see in an autonomic disorder? So uh, the disorders that we were focusing on, you know, namely POTS, um, it's, it's unusual to have severe bladder involvement. Um, that's more common in, you know, those more aggressive uh, autoimmune autonomic diseases, and, and the typical uh, manifestation would be bladder urinary retention, so um, inability to empty the bladder uh, because the nerves can't coordinate with the muscle of the bladder to empty it, so um, urinary retention, and then sometimes you can have sort of overflow incontinence from that, um, but, but, you know, we hear a lot of bladder symptoms um, from, from our other patients, like our POTS patients, um, when we do urinary, just you know, distinct objective testing, we don't see as many abnormalities, you know, as that other group with the more severe um, autonomic failure with urinary retention. Thank you for that. Um, I realized I forgot. I have uh, three quick poll questions. I would love to do a quick poll if everyone's willing. Um, it's voluntary. It's anonymous and um, so this is questions for people who think they had COVID, whether you were formally diagnosed or you really strongly suspect you had it. So here's the question. Have you had um, any abnormal blood pressure when standing up since you developed COVID? So you can answer this question. You can you can ignore it if you don't want to answer it, but it would be cool to we'll see the percentages of what people are telling us. Obviously, this is not real research because it's a very biased group of people who are interested in this topic. Um, but so we'll um, give everybody a few more seconds and um, we'll, uh, we will announce the results in probably about 20 seconds. Um, while we're, we're waiting for that, um, I did want to mention that, you know, in um, Dr. Miglis and I both talked about the POTS diagnostic criteria and he showed the tilt slides. I just want to clarify, in POTS, there are some people who have a slight blood pressure drop at some point in that 10-minute window that we're measuring their heart rate and blood pressure. And so a slight blood pressure drop, is it happens in about a third of POTS patients, and a slight blood pressure increase happens in about a third of, a third of POTS patients. Um, but that slight blood pressure drop is not the same thing as officially diagnosed orthostatic hypotension, which has a very specific requirement has a, a specific criteria. So I just want to make sure we clarify that because it is the whole, um, the diagnostic criteria for the autonomic disorders can be very confusing to patients because they, they seem like they overlap and they're very similar. And so you can have a little bit of low blood pressure with POTS, but if you have really severe drops in blood pressure every time you stand up, you probably don't have POTS, right? So, okay, I'm going to, um, finish up the poll. I have to figure out how to turn off closed poll. So we'll, well, I think we will all see the results now. Did it show everyone the results? Okay, maybe it doesn't show the results, but I'll tell you the answers. It said 12% of you said you've had low blood pressure on standing up. 23% have had high blood pressure on standing up. 20% had both low and high on standing. 16% said, nope, my blood pressure has been totally normal. And 29% weren't sure. So that's kind of interesting. You know, we'll have some more formal research on that um, eventually. <laughs> but that was sort of just interesting 
Um, let's see, show my screen. Okay, so um, I think that's it. If, if Dr. Minglis, did you have any additional things you wanted to go over with everyone? No, I just want to say uh, thank you, everybody, Lauren, and everybody for uh, for for jo joining. It looks like almost 400 400 people. So um, thanks for supporting our efforts to to understand this this disease. Yeah, thanks everyone. Sorry, my phone is ringing. I guess that's my timing that we it's time for me to get off the call. <laughs> so thanks everybody. We'll make this a, a visible webinar so that everyone can see it online, and uh, we'll email everyone who registered. Thank you so much. Bye.